Welcome to the Advocacy 101 webinar presented by the American Psychological Association. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions about continuing education credit, please email cpe at apa.org. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenters from the American Psycho Psychological Association, Alex Ginsberg, Senior Director of Congressional and Federal Relations, Scott Barstow, Senior Director of Congressional and Federal Relations, and Dr. Craig Fisher, Senior Science Policy Officer. Alex, welcome to the program. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this one credit continuing education course covering the basics of federal advocacy for psychology. My name is Alex Ginsberg and I work in the advocacy office for the American Psychological Association. I'll be joined in this course by two colleagues of mine also from APA's advocacy office, Scott Barstow and Craig Fisher. During this one hour course, we will be covering the basics of how to advocate for psychology and make your voice heard with policymakers. We have three learning objectives for this course. First, describe the important advocacy role that psychologists and graduate students in psychology play in educating and influencing policymakers. Psychologists have a long history of influencing public policy, and we hope by the end of this CE training, you'll feel more comfortable getting involved in the policymaking process. Second, explain the federal legislative processes and identify opportunities to influence each. Before getting started, it's often helpful to learn a little bit about the process you're trying to influence. During this training, we'll review the basics of federal lawmaking, including how a bill becomes a law. And finally, our third learning objective is to apply concepts and skills for effectively communicating with legislators and advocating for legislative change. This portion of the course will review effective tactics for communicating your message to policymakers and their staff, including some helpful tips for advocacy meetings to ensure they go smoothly. So why should you advocate for psychology? Let's get started. First off, why is advocating for psychology important? More importantly, why should you in particular advocate for psychology? To begin answering this question, we want to share this short video with you, which we think does a terrific job explaining and underscoring the importance of being a psychology advocate. Can one person change the world? It's not only logical, it's psychological. It took a psychologist to show that segregation damaged self-esteem in black children. Testimony to the Supreme Court that helped desegregate America's public schools. That the right design of a push-button keypad makes dialing fast and accurate. That massage therapy on preemies can save $3,000 per hospital stay. That no two people have the same fingerprints. That teaching people to change behaviors can prevent teen pregnancy and HIV that a lime yellow fire truck is safer than a red one. And now it takes you to keep changing the world, one person at a time, one conversation at a time, one message at a time. When you share what you know on Capitol Hill, you keep scientific research alive. You improve public health, physical health, mental health. Your expertise moves the process forward. Stop talking, and we all lose. So do it for you, them, us, and all of us. Because when psychologists affect change, they affect America. So as you can see, psychologists have a long history of making important contributions that have both transformed and informed public policies. This message is relevant whether your focus is psychological research, practice, or education. Uh, we like to start off showing new advocates this video because we want all of you to know that you can make a difference to public policy, as demonstrated by what so many other psychologists have done in the past. So let's start at the beginning. What is advocacy? Well, there are many definitions. We think this one captures it well for our purposes. Advocacy is a set of actions directed at decision makers in support or opposition of a specific policy issue. So what does this mean? Well, there are lots of different types of activities that make up advocacy. 
participating in a protest, voting, having a meeting on Capitol Hill, for example, we can all pretty easily guess are all forms of advocacy. However, there are also things you can do from home, like responding to an APA action alert to send a message to your legislators, picking up the phone and calling your congressional office, attending a town hall, or even tweeting your members of Congress. With that in mind, advocacy is about achieving a specific goal, whether that goal is to raise the profile of an issue through education or to change an existing law or program. Finally, it's important to remember that advocacy is not a single event. It's a process or a series of actions that are intended to affect some kind of change. And what, we, and what do we know about change? Well, when it comes to advocacy, it doesn't happen overnight. Often, advocacy can take many years of persistence. So why now? Well, because there are implications for non-involvement in advocacy. In other words, there are consequences for not getting involved. You've probably heard the expression, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. That expression very much applies here. Every day, there are hundreds of constituents and groups doing everything they can to speak up on behalf of their professions to influence policymakers. It's critical that we continue to step up and maintain our seat at the table. Because if we don't, we have a lot to lose. First, regarding federal policymaking, a lack of understanding of psychology may result in psychology not being considered an essential health profession or part of the STEM disciplines. Regarding programs, non-involvement might result in psychology being excluded from federal programs or included but with obstacles. Finally, regarding funding of federal grants or programs that are informed by psychology, non-involvement can result in flat funding or no funding at all. So what are the activities or tools we employ to maintain our seat at the table to ensure public policy is informed by psychology? Well, we like to think of advocacy as a three-legged stool. The first leg of the stool is educating. We educate members of Congress, their staff, federal officials about the role of psychologists and the contributions of psychological science to a range of issues, including education, substance use and addiction, violence prevention, health disparities. We cross the boundary from education to the second leg of the stool, lobbying, when we have a specific bill or program that we want Congress to support, oppose, or increase funding for. We lobby Congress either directly as staff, with members, with our members, or other organizations with similar legislative goals through coalitions. We also lobby through our grassroots network. Members of Congress are most interested in hearing what constituents like you have to say. Finally, the third leg of the stool is election activities. And for this, we have the Political Action Committee, or PAC, for psychology. The mission of the Psychology PAC is to raise funds from our members and affiliates to support the campaigns of congressional candidates who are champions of psychology's advocacy agenda. To close, remember that advocacy is all about building relationships. Being able to engage in all three of these activities allows us to build the most relationships to influence policy. So remember, no matter what level of advocacy you choose to get involved, keep in mind what I said earlier. Advocacy is a process, not a one-time event. We like to think of it as a marathon, not a sprint. Persistence is key. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott, who's going to discuss some of the basics of the federal legislative process. Thank you, Alex. So most of our presentation is going to focus on the quote unquote normal advocacy in which you communicate with your members of Congress. Alex referenced other forms of advocacy, such as marching and protesting. And I'd just like to reiterate that these should be considered a part of the democratic process that's necessary from time to time. But what we wanted to prepare you for in this session is making an impact on the more typical day in, day out policymaking that happens in Congress during the two years in between elections. And what we'd like to start with is teaching you a bit about how federal programs are created, funded, and implemented, and give you some context for how Capitol Hill operates. So as you probably remember, um, and as we're all taught in school, there are three branches of government under our Constitution. This presentation, again, is going to focus mostly on advocating with Congress. Um, if you think back to the famous Schoolhouse Rock video, in order for a bill to become a law, the same exact legislative language has to be approved in the same form by both the House and the Senate, and then signed into law by the President. But to dig a little bit deeper and help to mystify the legislative process, we've developed the following short video, which is available on our website.
The congressional policymaking process can seem complex and slow. Members of Congress each represent hundreds of thousands of constituents and have ideas across a wide range of policy areas on how to make life better for them. Representatives and senators introduce thousands of bills each year, but only a few become law. Congress was specifically designed to make it hard to enact new laws, and the design worked, but change happens when enough people make their voices heard. In fact, it usually only happens this way. Knowing a few key terms will help you understand how Congress works and help you be a better advocate for issues and legislation that impact psychology. One, Congress. Every even number year, we elect all 435 members of the House of Representatives and one third of the 100 members of the Senate. Residents of each of the 50 states have two senators and the number of representatives each state has depends on that state's population. The January after each election, a new Congress convenes for two years and each Congress starts fresh. All legislation considered by the previous Congress is thrown out and new committees and leadership positions are established and may change dramatically if the majority switches from one party to the other. Two, appropriation. Congress's primary job is to decide how our government spends money. Each year, it must pass legislation to appropriate money from the Treasury to fund the government. The House and Senate each have appropriations committees, which hammer out the details of federal spending. Three, authorization. Before a program can be funded, it must first be created. Programs are created when a committee with jurisdiction over its subject matter develops legislation authorizing the program for specific purposes by a specific agency for a specific period of time which is then enacted by Congress. Congress usually updates or reauthorizes programs in a certain area before the authorization ends. Four, mandatory programs. Some programs don't need an annual appropriation because Congress has passed laws mandating their continuous funding and operation. Examples include Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, programs affecting virtually all Americans. Congress will occasionally approve legislation to change how these programs work, but otherwise their operation is the responsibility of a federal agency. Five, vehicle. Besides agreeing on how much money to spend for federal programs each year, there isn't much else that Congress has to do, though the Speaker of the House and the Senate Majority Leader may work to bring legislation on major policy issues to a vote. On the rare occasions legislation in a certain area is expected to reach the House or Senate floor, members will often try to attach their own proposals to this legislative vehicle, kind of like getting a seat on a train you know is leaving the station. In most cases, committees only consider narrowly focused proposals on an issue as part of a package with other such proposals. Six, co-sponsor. A member of Congress who introduces a bill is known as that bill's sponsor, but his or her colleagues can officially sign on as a co-sponsor of that legislation to publicly show their support. Co-sponsoring a bill is the primary way to support a bill, short of voting on it. Only House members can co-sponsor legislation introduced in the House, and only Senators can co-sponsor Senate bills. The number, identity, and party membership of a bill's co-sponsors is a sign of how much support that bill has. Generally, bills with a large number of co-sponsors are likelier to be brought up for a vote than those with only a small number of co-sponsors. Seven, score. To help them keep track of how legislation will affect federal spending and deficits, members of Congress get an official assessment of this, known as a score, from the Nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, or CBO. A CBO score for a bill evaluates its financial impact for each of the next 10 federal fiscal years. With thousands of bills introduced each year, CBO typically doesn't crunch the numbers for a bill unless it's about to be voted on. Although this is just the tip of the iceberg on congressional procedure, these terms and concepts will help orient you to the day-to-day -day work on Capitol Hill. For questions or to learn more, please contact us at advocacy at APA.org. Thank you for being an advocate for psychology. So my apologies to residents of Puerto Rico and Washington, D.C. who do not have senators, but that may change someday. Um, I'd like to take a moment to add a couple of things to 
the picture painted by the video. One is to say a little bit more about the how federal agencies work. Um, and as the video stated, a lot of the day-to-day -day decisions about what federal programs do and do not accomplish and how they work are made by federal agencies, not by Congress. So it's becoming increasingly important for advocates to engage in the regulatory process. Typically, an agency will issue what's known as a proposed rule, describing in detail how they intend to implement a specific law or program and what their reasoning is behind their proposal. This slide shows a screenshot of a notice about a proposed rule. Um, and you can see that the, the title of the action posted there describes it as a proposed rule. <clears throat> proposed rules kick off a comment period during which the public and concerned parties can tell the agency what they think about the proposal and how they think the program should be implemented. After the comment period ends, the agency will take the comments into consideration and then issue a final rule, which generally describes the recommendations that they received about the proposal, um, what they think of those recommendations, and describing how exactly they've decided they're going to implement or enforce the law or program. Agencies also issue guidance, letters, statements, which are less formal ways of regulating than going through the rulemaking process. And as some of you probably have experienced yourselves, um, agencies also award grants and contracts and release notices on funding opportunities. The second thing I wanted to touch on um, and say a little bit more about is the role of committees. Committees are where most of the substantive consideration and almost all of the drafting and refining of legislation happens. And any hearings you see on TV or online, those are held by committees. When a bill is introduced, it is referred to the committee or sometimes committees, plural, that have jurisdiction over the issues the bill deals with. And as this slide suggests, it's much, much easier for a member on a committee of jurisdiction to affect what happens to a bill before that committee than it is for someone who's not on the committee. Um, it's easier to affect what happens to the bill early in the process than later. Once a bill gets to the House floor, there are a lot more votes you need to count and a lot less time for detailed work, kind of like concrete setting. The committee process is very important in the House since the House is structured in such a way as to allow the majority of its members to do what they want on an issue. It's a little less important in the Senate, which is structured to give individual senators the autonomy to do whatever they want, whenever they want. Um, that's not to say that committees are unimportant in the, in the Senate, just that they're not baked into the process quite to the same extent as they are in the House. Um, one other thing I'll say is that um, a, a word that you'll, you'll hear on Capitol Hill frequently that we didn't include in the video is markup, and it's used on this slide here. That's just the term used for a committee or subcommittee meeting where legislative language is hammered out and amendments are voted on. So with that, um, let's look at what life is like for members of Congress and their staff. Um, rule number one of communications is to know your audience and knowing how people spend their time is one of the best ways of getting to know them. This slide shows you what a typical day looks like for a member of Congress. And as you can see, it is packed. Um, this timeline is from a 2013 report from the Congressional Management Foundation, um, but it's still very representative today. It was also very representative of what a day would look like for the member of Congress that I worked for, um, from Oregon years ago. Um, notice that there are different groups, different types of meetings and events, different subject areas that the representative is bouncing around between pretty continuously throughout the entire course of the day. So imagine this, having this be your typical day and what that means for your typical week. And on the next slide, actually, you'll see the result. So this is from the same Congressional Management Foundation report. And what they found, not surprisingly, is that members of Congress typically work about 70 hours a week 
when Congress is in session, when their chamber is in session, and they work close to 60 hours a week, even when the House or Senate is not in session and they're back home in the district. Um, most of their time when they're in DC is spent on legislative work, policy work. When they're home in the district, most of their time is spent on constituent services work. And part of their time is devoted to political work, but probably not as much as you might think. Um, they are always on the go and they're talking to a lot of people day after day after day. And now let's turn to the congressional staff who work with them. This slide shows a typical Washington DC office staff structure for a house member. About half the staff are involved in tracking and working on legislation with others working to help handle press, communications, scheduling all those meetings the member is involved in. It's the legislative staff shown on this slide, the legislative director, legislative assistants, legislative correspondent, and to some extent also the chief of staff who do most of the policy work for members of Congress. And that includes meeting with constituents and lobbyists, talking to their colleagues, working for other members of Congress, tracking committee hearings, developing legislation, drafting responses back to constituents, and preparing talking points and statements. Members have a similar number of staff working in the district back home, focused on constituent services work. Um, the district director, shown on the slide here, is usually on par with the chief of staff of the DC office in terms of the hierarchy of the staff. Um, while most of the policy work is carried out by the, the DC policy staff, um, developing a relationship with a district director can be very, very helpful in advocacy work because the two offices do communicate constantly. Um, I should note that senators typically have more staff than House members. Um, they've done a better job of making sure that members of that chamber have adequate staff than has happened in the House. Um, but Senate staff have the same general structure and division of labor between the DC and district offices as these two slides show is the case for House members. So um, turning a little more closely to the legislative staff, this is an example of how one House office divides up issue areas. Some House members may have four legislative staff, and again, Senate offices usually have a little few more legislative staff, but this gives you an idea of how much those staff are expected to keep on top of. Um, when I was a legislative assistant, I was responsible for healthcare policy, welfare, social security, women's issues, children's issues, veterans, hunger, housing, Medicare, and Medicaid. You take that collection of issues, any of the, the collections here shown for the LD and the two LAs, that is a lot to keep on top of. Um, and if you think back to the examples, example day schedule for a member of Congress a few slides ago, that same switching from one issue to the next and from one meeting to another holds true for staff on a typical day um, the same way that it does for the member, just not quite to the same extreme. Legislative staff are an extension of the member of Congress they work for and forming a team with the member. They're always the same political party as their boss and usually just as ideological and just as committed to trying to make a difference and make the world a better place. But as you can see, it's a really tough job. We expect members of Congress to know what they're talking about in all of the areas listed on this slide. And when a member of Congress doesn't feel like she or he knows enough about something, they expect their chief of staff or one of these legislative staff to be able to tell them. So it's a very demanding job. And so not surprisingly, um, like their bosses, congressional staff work long hours. Um, more than 65% of staff work more than 50 hours a week, and a lot of them work more than 60 hours a week. Um, and again, they're trying to do a good job and make a difference. And like their bosses, they often spend more time dealing with angry constituents than getting thanks from anyone for the work that they do. Um, unfortunately, congressional staff aren't paid that well, especially given how expensive Washington DC has become to live, um, to live in, I should say. 
So staff usually don't stay in their offices, in their jobs for very long. Most staff who manage policy portfolios have only one to two years of experience on Capitol Hill and the average tenure on, um, on Capitol Hill is just over three years. So it's a, a tough job, it can be very rewarding, it's very interesting work, but um, they, they don't stick around forever and ever typically. So with that backdrop, there are a couple of other contextual points that you should keep in mind for working with members of Congress um, and their staff. One is that they're trying to serve more people than ever. Our country's population has been going up over the last several decades, but the number of senators and representatives hasn't, um, and generally neither has the number of congressional staff they have to help them do their work. Since 2000, it's like each member of the House of Representatives has a new moderately sized city of constituents to keep happy and about double the number of constituents that they had back in the 1950s. Um, there's an even more important point to keep in mind though, and that is that now we have computers. This photo is of either a member of Congress or a congressional staffer. I'm not sure which exactly, but when I saw it in a recent report, it took me back to my time working as a staffer for a House member from Oregon. One of my responsibilities was responding to constituent mail. That was a part of my job. And I would have a stack of letters from constituents on my issue areas. I would need to draft responses for my boss to send back to the constituents on. And it looked pretty much the same as the stack of letters this person is working through. And the stack would always seem to be about that high all the time as the letters kept coming in. What that photo doesn't show you, um, because it's from 1963, is what's shown in the chart on the right, um, which is the number of contacts coming into Congress has absolutely exploded with the advent of email. And if you look at the y-axis, notice that the units are hundreds of millions of communications. So it's all the same process, a constituent contacting the member of Congress about an issue, saying what they wanted the member to do and expecting a response, but now it doesn't take handwriting or printing a letter and sticking it in an envelope with a stamp. You can just send an email by clicking a button. Um, and remember, the number of congressional staff in each office has stayed about the same since the email explosion happened. So what that means um, is that by now, email constitutes about 80 to 90 percent of constituent communications. Um, the problem is that a lot of the emails look the same from the perspective of the member of Congress and his or her staff. And as a Congressional Management Foundation report from earlier this year stated, the high volume of identical form email advocacy campaigns generally does not substantively contribute to public policy and it requires significant staff time to manage process and respond to them. The massive amount of input that members of Congress and their staff get have forced them to operate like an emergency room triage unit. Um, in some cases, they don't even bother responding to identical form emails anymore. Um, and whenever possible, they'll use a canned response on an issue that they've already prepared to respond to someone writing on, on the same issue. And so the basic calculus that they're in using is that the more effort a contact takes on the part of a constituent, um, the more that contact, the more that uh, constituent will be listened to. But the fact is that they are listening. Um, they're simply trying to se separate the signal from the noise. A survey of members of Congress found that absolutely nothing contributes more to their job satisfaction. Whoops, sorry. Absolutely nothing contributes more to their job satisfaction than staying in touch with their constituents. They really want to know what's happening. They're just trying to sort the wheat from the chaff. Um, but it's, it's essential to their job. They do care. They are, they are listening. You just have to know how to, to speak their language. 
and the fact that they are so concerned about staying in touch with what is happening to their constituents and in their community is why state, provincial, and territorial psychological associations are an essential part of the federal advocacy process. State and local, state and local associations are literally close to home and members often care, usually care, more about what these organizations want them to do than about what a national organization wants them to do. Um, and this is borne out by another survey that the Congressional Management Foundation did. Um, the most effective form of communication for members who haven't already made up their mind about something is an in-person visit from a constituent. The next most effective form of communication is a contact from someone who represents a group of constituents. And next most effective are individualized email messages, which is something that Craig will talk about in a bit. And this ranking makes sense when you think about what they're trying to do. So to conclude this section, members are hearing from tens of thousands of constituents, getting hundreds of emails, calls, and letters a day, having scores of meetings each week. Um, and to reiterate something that Alex said, it's a marathon, not a sprint. One burst of energy, one meeting, one email isn't going to get the job done. In order to stay on their radar screen long enough to get their attention and to get them to do what you want them to do, you have to keep pinging them. And if you don't, your message is likely to be drowned out by the people who do. And with that, let me turn things over to Craig. Well, thanks, Scott. So now you've heard about why you should be an advocate for psychology, information about the federal legislative process and the makeup of congressional offices. Now let's shift into thinking about how you can uh, think about using your expertise to advocate for psychology and influence this process. What pieces of information are most important to communicate? How should you think about framing your message? To start to address these questions of how to advocate for psychology, we want to share with you another short video. In this video, we talk more about how to prepare for and participate in a congressional meeting. We think it does a great job of explaining some key points about communicating with Congress. And we hope to make it seem more fun and less intimidating. Although the video was developed with in-person meetings in mind, the key points still hold true for a variety of advocacy settings. The greatest thing you can bring to Capitol Hill is your message. More than a piece of paper, it's your research, your experience, your perspective, your voice. And when legislators hear your message, amazing things begin to happen. After all, your message to Congress proved that tobacco companies were hiding the truth, that juries were more fair when they grew from 6 to 12, that military and veteran suicide can be prevented. But every day, hundreds of other people show up to champion their cause. How do you make sure your life-changing, life-saving message gets through? First you create it. Come to the American Psychological Association and we'll help you speak directly to your audience and the needs of their district or state. Could your issue help them get reelected, win media attention, change policy, drive the economy? What happens if you lose? Leave out the scientific and research jargon. Leave in the personal, the human, the heart of the message. Then hand deliver it in comfortable shoes with a map and business cards. Arrive early. Cell phones turned off. Politeness turned on. If things get quiet, ask questions. Refer them to APA. But don't let your message get messy. Don't give them too much detail or spend too much time on small talk. Never underestimate the staff and their power. Stay away from discussing votes you disagree with or what else to cut to make room in the budget. And when you leave, make sure your message doesn't. Drop information packets and leave some with offices who couldn't schedule in-person meetings beforehand. You never know where that could lead. Send a brief thank you email CCing us. Share any insights from your visit with us at APA. Most of all, don't stop. Keep bringing your message to the Hill because our message is this. Every day funds are allocated. Laws are written, whether you are there or not. So if people on the Hill aren't hearing your voice, Good morning, I'm Dr. Warren. You can be sure they're hearing someone else's.
So whether it's an in-person meeting, a video meeting, or even a conference call, it's important to keep in mind your overall message needs to do at least three things. Your advocacy message should inform your target audience, so educate them about your issue. What are the details? Persuade your target audience, encourage them to see why your perspective on the issue is important, and ultimately to move your target audience to act. Thus, motivate them to take some specific action. Broadly, your communications on uh, an issue should be informed by these uh, key questions. Who is involved? What level of government is this occurring at? Who are the decision makers? What is happening? What exactly is the issue? Is it about something being proposed? Or is it about something being taken away? How is it happening? How is it happening? So who will be implementing it? Who will be enforcing it? Why is the story compelling? So what personal impact will this have on you and the people in your district? Where does it take place? Is it a local issue or does it have more national implications? In advocacy, we like to think about communications in three buckets. First, there is indirect communication, talking about someone or something. It can be media-based and includes letters to the editor, op-ed letters, social media, and demonstrations. Next is one-way communication, so addressing someone, directly addressing someone. It includes sending emails, such as when responding to an advocacy action alert, and letters. The third is two-way communication, which is relationship-based and more of a conversation. It can include congressional hearings and briefings, Capitol Hill meetings and in-district visits, site visits to your university, town halls, video meetings, phone meetings, and emails. The two-way or interactive type of communication is the most effective way of communicating with a policymaker or their staff. Although we typically aim for in-person meetings, it can also be done through video conferencing and phone calls. Conversational face-to-face -face time with members of Congress or their staff is widely, used as, widely viewed as the gold standard for getting your message across. So as researchers, educators and clinicians, we often think that data is everything. If we can just educate a member of Congress about a particular issue, that's all it will take to influence their thinking about an issue or guide any actions they might take. But data is only one of the many influences on policymakers. Members are also influenced by many other things, including party affiliation, if they're being compelled by leadership to vote a certain way, social media and what they see or read in the news, whether or not members are up for re-election this year, in which case constituents' views are especially important, and even their own life experiences. In determining what you can do to best influence your member of Congress, your most important source of power is that you're a constituent. So that's what you should leverage. Your member of Congress was elected to represent your district and state, and it's their job to listen to you and your concerns. For the past 20 years, the Congressional Management Foundation has been surveying congressional staff on what makes advocacy effective. As much as things have changed with technology, the results have stayed pretty consistent, with 94% of staff reporting that constituent visits hold the most influence on lawmaker decisions, more so than any other kinds of advocacy strategies and interactions with the staff. Even personalized email messages and letters are viewed as nearly twice as effective when compared to form email messages and postal letters. So we encourage you to use your influence as a constituent and personalize your interactions when meeting with or corresponding with members of Congress. Given that email is one of the most common ways for constituents to contact the members of Congress, it's important to know how to do so effectively. This video discusses some of the basics about how to email your member of Congress about your issue by crafting a clear and concise message in order to increase its impact. Every day, APA is advocating for psychology and psychologists on Capitol Hill. Your members of Congress want to hear from you, and together we can make an impact. As a psychologist, your grassroots voice is an essential part of our advocacy campaigns. Email is the primary form of communication between members of Congress and their constituents. So it's important to know how to email your legislators effectively if you want your voice to be heard. In less than five minutes, 
you can join thousands of other psychologists around the country in influencing policy. Step one, identify your members of Congress. Find your members of Congress on APA's Legislative Action webpage using the drop-down list on the Senate website at www.senate.gov or by entering your zip code in the search bar on the House website at www.house.gov. Once you identify your member of Congress, you will see a link or mail icon directing you to the appropriate contact page. You'll need to be sure you're emailing your representative and senators. Members of Congress are too busy responding to their constituents to respond to people outside their district or state. Step two, compose your message in about 100 to 200 words, sticking to just one issue. In one or two sentences, tell them who you are. Then ask for a specific action. Finally, in your own words, say why you want your legislator to take the action. If you have a pertinent story, share it. Research shows that personalized emails have vastly more impact than getting the same form email over and over. Taking one minute to personalize the sample text we give you will dramatically increase your message's impact. Step three, send APA a copy of your message. If you're using your congressperson's website, copy and paste the body of your message into an email and send it to advocacy at APA.org. This makes it easy to keep track of when you contacted your legislator and what you asked them to do so we can work more effectively with that office on the advocacy issues important to you. If you send your message through APA's Legislative Action Center, we'll receive a copy of your message automatically. Step four, follow up. You may receive an automated response immediately after sending your email. If you don't receive a more personal response within three weeks, call your congressperson's Washington DC office. Congressional offices are flooded with constituent contacts, so be patient, but don't be afraid to be a squeaky wheel in a polite way if you don't get a response. Thanks for your interest in impacting federal policy. If you have any questions, email us at advocacy at APA.org. So, like emails to members of com Congress, comments to federal agencies are submitted electronically, but it's actually easier. You don't have to prove your constituent for one thing. Sometimes agencies solicit input from specific groups, but otherwise they're allowing everyone to comment since they're making federal policy decisions that apply nationwide. Regulatory comments are also a numbers game in a way that's not true with members of Congress. If an agency gets thousands and thousands of comments on one side of an issue, but only a handful on the other, going to be hard pressed to decide in favor of the handful. Ultimately though, both numbers and quality count. It's not as essential as it is for members of Congress, but it still makes uh, your comment more impactful to personalize it. And whether you're emailing a member of Congress, participating with them in a video conference, meeting with them in person, without question, personal stories are like gold and critical to making the case about why your issue matters. In the survey of congressional staff, only 18% said they frequently heard a personal story related to a legislative request. 79% of them would have found a personal story from the constituent to be helpful to a congressional visit. Knowing this information should provide you with a keen understanding of just how important your personal story is. Congressional staffers meet with many groups every day, all who bring fact sheets, data points, and statistics to their meeting. The fact of the matter is, no matter how compelling a statistic itself is, it's the story that brings the statistic to life. It's the story that illuminates serious problems and issues in the district, and stories are long remembered when data points are or not. Although we understand that not every issue lends itself to this sort of storytelling, it should always be the goal. And remember, as the saying goes, all politics is local. So members of Congress care deeply about how an issue impacts their own district or state. So finding commonalities with the policymaker or staff that relate to local issues is another great way to build a relationship with your legislator. Remember, they're all people too, with families, friends, and strong personal connections to your community. This can sometimes be hard information to come by, but if you can, try to get more information about the local impact of a proposed policy, the data, the details, and of course, the stories. 
In what way does it affect lives, jobs, or the economy in your state or district? How this policy impacts your community will really matter to the member of Congress and their staff. By providing this information, you can start to build an ongoing relationship with their office. With their office. One of the most important parts of a congressional meeting is referred to as the ask, or what specific action are you requesting that the member of Congress takes? Be clear and concise when delivering your message and request to policymakers. What is it you want them to do? Constituents often ask their members to co-sponsor legislation, vote a certain way on an issue, or support an agency's or program's funding level. Legislators need to know how this issue is affecting their state or district, and the ask communicates what action they can take that will address your issue. The timing of your communication does require some level of knowledge about current events and the congressional calendar. APA staff can serve as a good resource in determining when is the most appropriate time to approach and communicate with members of Congress on a particular issue. So what do you do if you can't get in to see your member of Congress? We've already mentioned that using other means aside from congressional meetings can help develop relationships with policymakers or their staff. Using social media and traditional media can draw attention to your issue and increase the chances for your voice to be heard. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas high school student Emma Gonzalez is an example of someone who became nationwide the face of school shootings and an advocate who effectively used social media to further her efforts. A survivor of the Florida high school shooting, Gonzalez became a vocal advocate for gun violence prevention and in just two weeks surpassed the number of Twitter followers of a well-known pro-gun lobbying organization. So we need you to bring your message, your clinical experience, your scientific experience, your teaching experience. In other words, your expertise and perspective as a psychologist, researcher, educator, or graduate student. Pill meetings often last for just 15 minutes total, so you need to prepare to concisely convey these key pieces of information. Now with that, let me turn it back over to Alex Ginsberg to discuss some tips for successful advocacy meetings. So now that you've heard a bit about the legislative process from Scott, a bit about how to effectively deliver your message from Craig, I'm gonna give you a few helpful tip, tips to ensure that your meeting runs smoothly. I'm also gonna tell you a little bit about what to expect in a meeting with a legislator or a member of his or her staff, whether the meeting is on Capitol Hill or in the district. So let's start at the very beginning with some basics. How do you request a meeting with your legislator or a member of their staff? Do you have to travel to Washington, D.C.? The answer is no, you do not have to travel to Washington, D.C. to advocate. You can schedule what we call an in-district meeting. We'll go over some of the benefits of having an in-district meeting on the next slide. In addition to their Washington, D.C. offices, all members of Congress have offices in their home states and districts. Uh, larger offices, act larger districts actually may have several locations. You can find the contact information for your, member, your member's Washington, D.C. office and local district offices on their website. Begin the process of requesting a meeting, simply call the phone number of whichever location you prefer to have your meeting. If you'd like to request a meeting with a staffer, the process is simple. Call the office number and simply ask for the name and email of the staffer covering the legislative issue you plan to speak about, for example, health or education. From there, you can follow up with an email to that staffer, which can be very brief. We've provided a sample email to a staffer here on this slide. If you'd like to request a meeting with your member of Congress, the process is a few additional steps. First, after you decide whether you prefer to meet with your legislator in Washington, D.C. or the district, you want to make sure that the date you select for your potential meeting aligns with the congressional calendar and the member schedule. Remember, members of Congress split their time between Washington, D.C. and the district. So you want to avoid requesting a meeting for a date in the district, for example, when you know Congress is in session and your member of Congress is likely to be in Washington, D.C. To help pick a suitable date for your meeting, just do a little research on the internet beforehand and look up what's called the current congressional calendar. This will tell you what the current Congress, when the current Congress is in session, including the dates of when they're in the district, known as district, known as district work weeks, um, and when they're in Washington. Once you have that date in mind, call the office of the location you want to have the meeting and ask for the name and contact information for the member's scheduler. Follow up with an email request to the individual detailing the purpose of the meeting and who you expect to be present. Please know that APA staff are always available to assist you in scheduling a meeting with your congressional office. Before moving on, 
just a quick bit of information on the importance of in-district meetings. Remember, you don't have to travel to Washington, D.C. to advocate. District offices focus on responding to the needs of local constituents, and they work closely with their counterparts in Washington. There are tons of benefits to having in-district meetings. Because members' schedules tend to be less hectic in the district than in Washington, constituents are often more likely to have an in-person meeting with their legislator in the district than in Washington, D.C. In addition, we often hear that constituents have longer meetings with their representatives in the district than in Washington. So we definitely encourage you to set up an in-district meeting because building relationships with your district office is just as important as building relationships with your member's Washington office. All right. So you've set up your meeting with your legislator or a member of your staff. What are a few things that you can do ahead of time to prepare? Well, first you wanna do some research. Why? Because you wanna figure out a way to align your request with his or her priorities. Start by doing a simple search on the internet to find your member's webpage. From there, you'll be able to find his or her stances on issues, as well as your member's policy priorities. If your ask is for your member to co-sponsor a piece of legislation, be sure to look up what legislation he or she has co-sponsored recently. First, you want to make sure that he or she is not already a co-sponsor of the legislation. If so, then your ask would shift to a thank you for supporting this legislation. If your member is not currently a co-sponsor of the legislation you have in mind, looking through previous legislation that he or she has co-sponsored will give you a good idea of what their stance might be on your legislation. Other pieces of information to research about your legislator are what committees they serve on, what caucuses they're a member of. To get a sense of what their office is working on right now, take a quick scan of their recent press releases. Remember, the purpose of doing all of this research is so you can find a way to align your interests with theirs. In addition, if you're meeting as part of a group, be sure to talk to the other members of your group ahead of time to plan who will say what. This will make sure you'll be able to get all of your talking points across and that your message or messages are delivered smoothly. So let's go over a few do's and don'ts for your advocacy meeting. Keep in mind that these tips apply whether you're meeting with a staffer or a member, having a virtual or in-person meeting. Remember, as Craig said, we need you to bring your expertise and perspective as a psychologist, researcher, educator, or graduate student. Again, you may have more time if you're meeting in district, but on average, Capitol Hill meetings are only 15 minutes long, so you need to be prepared to concisely deliver your message. First, do introduce yourself and mention where you're, you are from in district and your professional affiliation. You want to establish yourself as a constituent. For example, hi, my name is Dr. Ginsburg and I'm a constituent from Fairfax County, Virginia. Next, do discuss the issue of concern and your connection to the topic, ideally through, told through a personal story or an anecdote. For example, I'm here today on behalf of the American Psychological Association to discuss mental health concerns in our district. This issue is personally important to me because growing up, I had a brother with autism. That's what drove me to become a psychologist in the first place. Next, do you ask the member of Congress or staffer to take some sort of action. So something like, Given the growing mental health concerns in our district and stigma surrounding seeking mental health services, I am asking your office to co-sponsor HR 1234, which would establish June 31st as National Family Mental Health Day. At the end of your meeting, do say thank you and offer yourself as a resource if they have any follow-up questions. Finally, do take pictures and share on social media. Encourage others to get involved. So now that we've gone over a few do's for your meeting, a couple don'ts as well. Don't underestimate staff. Be prepared. The average age for a Hill staff assistant is early to mid-20s. Staffers may be young. They are the policy leads for those respective areas. Many have years of experience in an issue area and communicate regularly with other experts. As a result, they probably have a good grasp of the 40,000 view of the issue. Don't express disappointment for not meeting with the member. As Scott mentioned, members of Congress have a lot going on during their average day. Uh, often things come up at the last minute, so be flexible. Don't take a phone call or text during a meeting. Basic etiquette goes a long way. Any distraction during a meeting will take away from the limited amount of time you do have with a staff or a member. Don't be surprised if another issue is raised. 
This happens as meetings progress and staffers remember questions or topics from other meetings. As Scott mentioned earlier, these staffers are covering a ton of issues. If you aren't sure about an answer to a question, simply say, that's a great question. I'm not sure about the answer, but I or APA will be happy to find out and get back to you. If the meeting goes off track, politely redirect it back to your original request. Remember, it's up to you, to you, it's up to you and your colleagues to steer the conversation back. Don't overestimate the influence of data. As Craig said, as scientists and academics, we often think that if we can just convince them with the data, they'll be able to see our view. And while data can be an important, and it can be important to help your argument, it's personal stories that make a real impact, often when data is long forgotten. Remember, don't forget that you're the expert and the voter. You have unique education, training, and experiences which are invaluable during a meeting. Be confident, it's their job to listen to your concerns. Don't get political, remember. Your meeting will be short. If you spend seven minutes getting into a political discussion about something, or even making small talk, that's seven minutes of your meeting you won't get back. Use them wisely and remember why you're there to move them to action. So before I turn it back to Scott, just a few tips for after your congressional meeting. First of all, always send a thank you note. After your meeting, we'll provide a sample thank you note on the following slide. Um, as we've mentioned, advocacy is about relationship building and maintaining those relationships. So it's important to continue contact. One good follow-up activity is to work with your faculty to, to arrange for your member of Congress or a member of their staff to do a site visit at your institution or program. Remember to keep informed about your legislative request. For example, if you know that your legislation is that you're requesting uh, is going before a certain committee that the member of Congress sits on, that's a great time to follow up with them. And finally, continue to engage with APA. We want to hear always about the fabulous advocacy work that you're doing on behalf of psychology. Promised. Uh, just to make your follow-up even easier, here is a sample follow-up email to a staffer. Again, this is a great opportunity to summarize your meeting, reiterate your most compelling talking points, provide electronic, electronic versions of any materials you had during your meeting, and of course, restate your ask. Don't forget to offer to be a resource to their office in the future. Finally, remember what we've been saying throughout this presentation, persistence is key. Building a long-term relationship is beneficial, even if you're bringing the same message to the same staff person every year. This keeps the issue on your congressional office's radar, because the easy way to, easiest way to forget about an issue or a program is if we stop talking about it. And with that, I will hand it back to Scott, who is going to wrap things up for us. Thank you, Alex. By now, you've probably noticed a common theme across all the ways of engaging with your members of Congress. Be prepared, be polite, be specific about what you want them to do, and again, be persistent. I know we are being persistent in encouraging you to be persistent, but it's a, it's a key point. Approach it like you're developing a relationship or a, a partnership because you are. Democracy is a continuous process, and just like you need to call a plumber sometimes or an electrician to fix a leak or install a new circuit breaker, you need your representative and your senators to keep things running well for you in your community. You're paying them to do this, and it's going to be a lot harder for them to do their job if you don't let them know how you want them to do it. Have their number handy and stay engaged with them. And realize that it's not always going to work. In many cases, you won't get the answer you want, but as Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, I have no expectation of making a hit every time I come to bat. What I seek is the highest possible batting average. And as we've described here today, there are ways to increase your batting average. And to quote another great American, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, if you're going to change things, you have to be with the people who hold the levers. It is extremely, extremely rare to be represented by an elected official who you always agree with. No candidate is perfect. Um, and by the same token, it's extremely rare to be represented by an elected official who you always disagree with. It's perfectly okay to vehemently disagree with your legislator's position on one issue or even several issues but still have a great working relationship with the office on other issues. The late John D. Dingell, the longest serving member in congressional history, wrote in his book, 
Dean of the House, that, quote, differences on one policy do not require differences on all policies. So despite opposing him on Vietnam, I still worked with Nixon on the environment. Looking for the good in everyone makes it possible to find allies in the strangest places, end quote. Finding the areas where you can agree is what makes most policy changes possible. And it's your right to politely and respectfully continue to make your voice heard on an issue even when your elected official doesn't agree with you. If enough other people in your community do the same thing, you might be able to change their mind. If you're gonna change things, you have to be with the people who hold the levers. And I'll add that if that doesn't work, get a little bit closer so that you can put your hands on the lever too. On behalf of all three of us, thank you so much for listening. Please reach out to APA staff if you have questions, comments, or news to share, and we look forward to working with you. We're now ready to close. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the APA, we would like to thank you for watching this webinar. Remember, to receive continuing education credit, please complete the quiz and evaluation. You will receive your documentation of CE credit soon after. This concludes our presentation.